Dobadan. Thank you very much for that kind uh, introduction. And I would like to begin by thanking you very much for this honour uh, of the invitation to speak this afternoon. It's a very great honour and I'm delighted to be here. As indicated, this is a presentation in which I want to offer some broad reflections on the trajectory of policy developments with regard to women and criminal justice over the last 20 years. And in particular, I want to address some of the myths, muddles and misconceptions which have shadowed ideas about women offenders and their treatment. Secondly, I examine whether there is a case for dealing with women differently from men in sentencing. And thirdly, I question whether equality should mean difference. I shall draw on some research evidence from England and Wales, but as I understand it, uh, there are fewer women than men involved in crime in Slovenia. They are responsible for about 4% of known criminal acts. And there has also been suggestion in Slovenia uh, that women are treated more leniently than men in the criminal justice system. So there are some interesting parallels. For those of you who would like a very short version of my paper, the question is, is gender discrimination necessary? Firstly then, let me turn to some myths, muddles and misconceptions. One of the myths is that women have been viewed and always viewed sympathetically and treated leniently within the criminal justice system. This is a very common assumption amongst the public and indeed amongst the media. Yet looking back at history, we can see very different attitudes to women. And as one prison matron put it in 1862, as a class, they are desperately wicked. As a class, deceitful, crafty, malicious, lewd, and devoid of common feeling. Historically, of course, there were assumed links between female offending and sexuality, and indeed moral depravity. Somehow, women offenders were seen to be worse than male offenders. At the same time, history records that women have been able to plead the belly in order to extract more lenient sentencing, to claim that they were pregnant, and from 1850s onwards, there were clear calls for differentiation in the treatment of male and female offenders, which led to a number of significant changes in the 19th century, ranging from the special provisions for women in prison, extra thick mattresses in prison cells, and sewing classes, for example. There were also plans to redevelop the main prison in England and Wales for women so as to accommodate their special needs. This was a plan in the 1960s and the idea was to develop a distinctive therapeutic regime for women because it was thought that women's offending behaviour belied troubled backgrounds. But the idea of a therapeutically orientated prison very quickly became outmoded cost considerations got in the way, as well as there being prison officer uh, association politics, amongst other things, which resisted that particular development. Institutional arrangements for women aside, the sentencing of women and the content of institutional regimes provided for women and girls within have long since reflected elements of the penal welfareism. Broadly speaking, a large body of research has identified three main aims that are particularly relevant to the treatment of women. First of all, a woman who enters the courtroom, who enters the criminal justice system, has been described as incongruous, out of place. Explanations for her offending behaviour and her presence in the courtroom have been sought within the discourse of the pathological and the irrational, menstruation, mental illness, 
poor socialisation and the menopause have all featured in explanations here and all have been subject to critique. Men have not been viewed as so out of place in the courtroom and so their offending has been explained in very different ways within the discourse of normality and rationality, for example. In addition, certain factors such as marital status, motherhood, social problems and welfare needs seem to have influenced the sentencing of women, but not that of men. My own early research on social inquiry reports, forerunners of pre-sentence reports, showed a difference in the very way in which offenders were portrayed, with the focus on women in such reports being on their feelings and their families, their relationships. But the reports on men have focused very much on what they've actually done and what they actually do, whether or not they are employed. It's a crude distinction, perhaps, but there appears to be a focus, or has appeared to be a focus, on men's deeds and women's needs. Similar social, pathological and familial themes have been identified in prisons also, and Pat Carlin captures the nature of the penal welfare direction of the treatment of women in her memorable phrase that women's prisons discipline, infantilize, feminize, medicalize, and domesticize. Writing about women's imprisonment at the turn of the century, Pat Carlin emphasized the dominance of ideas about women's place in the family. And she says, women's families, responsibilities and previous family histories interact variously with dominant ideologies about women's place in the family and contradictorily within the rigours of state punishment to increase several fold the pains of penal incarceration. Such depictions of criminal justice for women have led to various complaints about the inappropriate use of gender role stereotypes and gender appropriate behaviour in the courtroom, including critical accusations that women are treated more harshly than men. But the picture is quite confusing. On the one hand, we have an evil woman thesis, whereby women are seen to deserve double punishment for having offended and offended against the gender role stereotype. At the same time, there is suggestion that there is chivalry or a lenient attitude towards them. There is also paternalism, and thus we find a picture of leniency and harshness in the interests of moral protection. Now, there are very many different research studies which have tried to look at whether or not the courts are harsh or lenient towards women. I am not going to go through all of these research studies, but I put them on the slide just to illustrate the very different findings. Some studies suggest harshness, some studies suggest leniency. There is a very confusing picture. On the one hand, we have the image of women being sent to prison very quickly in their criminal careers. We also learn that women are found guilty of being women, especially when they offend against the gender role stereotype. Indeed, the picture is very confusing indeed. There are very mixed perceptions of the sentencing of women claims that women are treated leniently and claims that they are treated more harshly than men, with penal welfare considerations and gender role stereotypes being tied up in these very mixed understandings of sentencing. So much so that over time, and notwithstanding radical feminist arguments for a separatist feminist jurisprudence, there have been calls for more equal sentencing and a focus on women's deeds rather more than needs, precisely so as to avoid distinctions being drawn between the gender-conforming deserving female offender and the non-conforming offender. 
who is not deserving of lenient treatment. It's certainly not the case that all women have been treated leniently. The picture is much more complex than this. The next myth that I want to expose is that women are all now being treated as harshly, or very harshly. This is a myth which has been promoted by modern analyses of the culture of control. David Garland's book, The Culture of Control, which I suspect that some of you have heard of, is worth mentioning here because he describes a punitive turn in Western society and an eclipse of penal welfareism, by which he means assessment and treatment of offenders for their own good. There is certainly the appearance of a culture of control and increased punitiveness, which has overshadowed previous sentencing practices. This graph shows an upward rise in the use of imprisonment over time from 1990 to 2007. Simply, the average prison population quadrupled. Receptions into women's prisons doubled, nearly doubled. And receptions of females on remand and under sentence increased by over 100 So what's happened? How can we explain this? Well, have there been changes in women's crime that would help explain this punitive turn towards women and what David Garland has described as an eclipse of penal welfareism? Is there more serious offending, for example? Are Are there increases in women's crime? The simple answer is no. Collectively, notwithstanding indications of some serious offending, cruelty or neglect of children, for instance, women's offending is largely financial and property related. Lots of shoplifting. Women form a numerical majority in just two groups, offences relating to prostitution and the offence of avoiding paying for a television licence. The media have made much of apparent increases in violence by women over the last few years, but a close look at the criminal statistics reveals that the bulk of violent offences are made up of those categorised as less serious, and they're mainly committed by young women around pubs and clubs, late-night dance clubs. There have been some changes in patterns of crime concerning drugs also. But these changes also occur at the lower end of the seriousness scale. The majority of women's drugs offences between 1995 and 2005 related to unlawful possession rather than to a more serious offence such as the sale of controlled drugs. And 90% of the possession cases involved Class B drugs, that is cannabis, and and, and less less serious drugs. Overall, we can conclude that women continue to be involved in less serious crime, and that this did not really change over the period when there was a huge increase in women's imprisonment, except with regard to less serious violence, and drugs. There were some small increases in theft and burglary too, but not enough to account for the huge increases in women's imprisonment. There are obviously some other questions to ask too about the increase in the use of imprisonment for women. Has there been a change in the type of women being sentenced? Well, the answer again is no. Are women being sentenced more equally than hitherto? That is, are they now being sentenced like men? When it comes to sentencing being more equal with women being sentenced more like men as an explanation for the increase in the use of imprisonment for women, we would first of all have to prove that sentencing has been unequal 
I don't think we can do this. As previously indicated, sentencing, the sentencing of women, has been very confused. We have a very confused and mixed picture. The criminal statistics and research studies show differences in sentencing. Many of these relate to the type and seriousness of offences. Certainly, there is evidence to suggest that gender-related factors mediate sentencing, but this has as much to do with the stereotypes of gender-appropriate behaviour than straightforward disparities in sentencing for males and females. Interestingly, in the USA, there is support for the idea that sentencing guidelines in some states have reduced racial, gender and other disparities thus effectively raising severity for women, but not greatly. And the situation is complicated by the fact that women, more than men, benefit from mitigated departures from such guidelines. Another question concerns increases in the lengths of women's prison sentences. Is this where the answer lies for the increases in women's imprisonment? But the changes with regard to the lengths of sentences are modest, as the slide shows. In 1995 to 2005 in the Crown Court, which is the higher court, there was a change from 19, an average sentence of 19.6 months, to just 22.9 months in 2005. And in the lower court, in the magistrate's court, where most criminal offending behaviour is dealt with, there was no real change at all during this period. More generally, in regard to sentences, changes in sentencing, we should note the increase in the use of immediate custody following restrictions on suspended sentences of imprisonment brought into effect by new legislation in 1991. And it's possible that some of this increase, but not all of it, some of the increase in the use of imprisonment, but not all of it, may be attributed to this. There's also been a marked reduction in the use of financial penalties, which might lead us to think that there has been up-tariffing. People pushed up the sentencing tariff to receive tougher penalties. But at the same time, there has been a marked increase in the use of community penalties too, but are taking from below in the tariff rather than from above, uh, from the group perhaps deserving fines rather than the group who've been imprisoned. Let me summarise. Overall, relatively few women commit crimes. While it's clear that there have been some changes in sentencing patterns, no one reason for this stands out as more persuasive than any other and the type of woman imprisoned remained much the same as it did in 1990. Most were criminally unsophisticated, at low risk of reoffending. Most were serving their first sentence, their first custodial sentence, and a short sentence at that. And most were sent to prison for property offences, theft and handling. If the empirical evidence tells us anything, and even here I think there is more analysis to be done, then it seems to be that the sentencing of older, petty, persistent female offenders and less serious, violent female offenders, um, the sentencing of them to prison, alongside the imprisonment of foreign national women for drug offences, and it's those things which has helped to drive the prison population upwards, as well as the more general culture of control which David Garland writes about. But as to the eclipse of penal welfareism, that's an entirely different matter. Sentencing changed, yes, but even after exposure to human awareness and anti-discrimination training in the 1980s and early 1990s, all designed to ensure that men and women were treated equally, judges and magistrates in the lower courts subsequently revealed that they tend to see women as troubled rather than troublesome. 
and that they were more likely to see women's offending behaviour as a reflection of their caring roles and as a matter of survival, or as a result of provocation or coercion, or indeed attributable to some mental disturbance. So let me now turn briefly to a study which I did in the 1990s. And this is a study which reveals that the judges, magistrates, were still thinking in a paternalistic way in regard to women. They still viewed women as being out of place in the courtroom. This was a study which involved 13,000 uh, adult cases of offences against the person, uh, drug offences and theft from shops drawn from the National Offender Index, which is a national database in England and Wales. And with colleagues, I tried to look at the sentencing patterns of males and females. The results of the first part of the study suggested that women tended overall to receive less severe sentences than men, even when account was taken of previous convictions, and that women tended to be fined less frequently and to receive either a discharge, a nominal penalty, or a community sentence more frequently than men. And here we have some of the findings. The magistrates in the lower court were resistant to imposing financial penalties on women. Men and women had an equal chance of being sent to prison for a first violent offence, but not amongst repeat offenders. <coughs> women had, a less, had less chance of going to prison for a second violent offence uh, than, women, uh, than, than men. Women first offenders regarding drugs offences were less likely than men to receive a prison sentence. But recidivists, those people who repeated offending, they were just as likely to be sent to prison. So again, we have a very confusing picture of sentencing. The study also identified harsh and lenient courts on the basis of the statistical comparison. And the second part of the study broke new ground by exploring through interviews with nearly 200 magistrates in these courts their approaches to sentencing. What were they thinking about when they were sentencing men and women? And this is very interesting. First of all, they tended to view women as being more troubled than troublesome. They also took into account the woman's body language and appearance. The more feminine the woman presented herself, the more likely the magistrates were to be lenient towards the woman. They also took into account family responsibilities and they were pleased when a woman was happily married or in a long-term relationship with children. In other words, when she conformed to the gender role stereotype. Sometimes fines were seen as unsuitable for women caring for children uh, without independent means because the magistrates could see that the fines wouldn't affect the women so much as they would affect the children. And it would be unfair to impose the um, fines on the children for the, for the children to suffer. And these are some of the things that they said. A shoplifting woman would probably be a single mother without enough money. A shoplifting man would very rarely be a single father without enough money and kids yapping round. They would be lads out on the town wanting to get a snappy pair of jeans or Nike shoes or something like that. And as one magistrate said, think of them, women, offenders, think of them as greedy, needy or dotty. And another magistrate said, the women feed the family, whereas the men, although they have to support their family, they don't. So all in all, penal welfareism seems to live on. <laughs> 
More than this, one might argue that increased awareness of women's individual and distinctive needs has possibly encouraged the use of imprisonment. Certainly, there's been lots of research on female offenders which has indicated that the pains of imprisonment are notable. A high number of them experience a wide range of social problems. Suffice to say here that research evidence shows that although some of the needs of male and female offenders are similar, women are also uh, likely to have particular needs in relation to childcare responsibilities. They're very often single parents. They have high needs in relation to drug or alcohol abuse. They have limited qualifications, lack of work skills or experience, low income and histories of abuse. So put this general growing awareness of women's needs alongside the undoubtable improvements to the regimes in women's prisons following pressure group interest and we can see how imprisonment might be attractive to sentences considering how best to deal with women. We also have to think about prisons as late modern social services. Prison is the place You put people when there is nothing else to do with them. So there may be a threefold effect of up-tariffing women because of reluctance to find find them, penal welfareism, a toughening up of the sentencing women as as part of a new culture of control, and a perception that a prison sentence creates a reasonable prospect of women's personal and social needs being met punitive and penal welfare approaches combined. So rather than suggesting that there has been a displacement of the penal welfare approaches in sentencing and in prison regimes and so on, I want to suggest that the two strategies coexist. There's no contradiction here, but a complex interweaving of discourses. To conclude this part of the paper then, Whichever way we look at it, the increase in the imprisonment of women both fulfills David Garland's picture of the culture of control and challenges it insofar as the penal welfare complex in relation to women has never really disappeared. Even the increase in the use of imprisonment may be partly due to sentences seeing that this is a way of meeting women offenders' needs. If you're confused by all of this, it's because it's a very complex tale. A, history abounds with myths, muddles and misconceptions regarding the treatment of offenders. B, modern analyses of the culture of control suggest that the whole panoply of criminal justice is now harsher towards offenders. C, if we add women into the analysis, we can see that there is both increasing punitiveness punitiveness towards women with increasing use of custody, not wholly explained by simple changes in the seriousness of offending or by changes in sentencing patterns, but by a more punitive turn. And we can also see a residual penal welfareism in regard to women in the processes of sentencing. However, penal welfareism, D, Penal welfareism has attracted criticisms in the past because it has led to distinctions being drawn between deserving and undeserving women. The arguments have been that women and men should be treated in the same way and that women shouldn't be discriminated against because of perceptions of their needs, high needs sometimes, getting in the way of an understanding of the relatively low-level seriousness of their deeds, what they've actually done, the the offences that they've actually committed. Let me then now turn to the second part of my presentation. Is there a special case for suggesting that women offenders deserve a distinctive sort of treatment in the criminal justice system compared to men? And there are two things that I want to mention here very quickly. One concerns women's distinctive needs, and secondly, the second thing is what we can learn from what works with women. So, what do we know 
about women offenders and their criminogenic, that is crime-related, needs. This is just a snapshot of the needs taken from the national database in regard to women offenders. And we can see from the statistics that a high proportion of women experience uh, domestic violence. A high proportion have accommodation needs. A high proportion have relationship problems. A high proportion have well-being needs too. So women are a very needy lot. My sense is that this is a common picture in relation to women offenders. Indeed, if we look at women in prison, similarly, we can see that they are a needy group. There are widespread mental health problems. Five times the proportion of women in the general population who have psychiatric disturbance. Women in prison are five times more likely to experience uh, psychological disturbance and have uh, drug and substance misuse uh, problems. The number of women in prison is relatively low compared to the number of men. Those who get to prison seem to serve very short sentences. But as I say, they are a very needy group. Going on from that, we can see that even when women were remanded in prison, 80% go on to receive a non-custodial sentence or they were acquitted. So why were they sent there in the first place? Only a very small proportion, 3.2% of women, were assessed as being of high risk of serious harm to others in the community. A very small proportion commit violent offences, for example. More figures showing the problems, the social problems that women experience with self-harming, alcohol problems, drug problems and problems with relationships. And yet, we also learn that relatively few women are in prison for violent offences, as I've indicated, most, over 60% are there for non-violent offences. Some of these figures repeat uh, what I've already said, but picking out one thing, one, one in four women in prison has experienced time in local authority care. LA care, they've been in children's homes and so on. Now, it's only recently that we've begun to recognise more nuanced accounts of women's pathways into crime, with recognition that women don't offend as much as men and that their offending behaviour is of a less serious nature. There have been moral panics about women's crime, particularly in relation to violent crime, as I hinted, and particularly in relation to girl gangs. But it's very hard to sustain the arguments in this direction in light of the research evidence and statistical analysis of patterns of crime. Further research studies simply rehearse the points that I'm making, that women who end up in prison have very high needs. They have experiences of social problems, so on and so forth. This, of course, affects their children. About two-thirds of women in prison have children, and uh, around 18,000 children are affected annually by the imprisonment of their mothers. So, where does this take us? Does this, does this amount to a case for dealing with women differently? Certainly, when we look at the lives of women who end up in prison, we can see that there are psychological sequelae which can lead to offending behaviour. The victimisation experiences make women vulnerable. Now, the second strand of thinking that I want to mention here relates to what works with women. It has to be said that notwithstanding huge amounts of work on what works in the last 10, 15 years, much of it in Canada and much of it revolving around cognitive behavioural programmes, women have only been considered as correctional afterthoughts. And indeed, for all the work on cognitive deficits, 
One researcher, Anne Worrell, has pointed out that women who offend are not driven by cognitive deficits, but by the social problems which they experience. One of the other problems in looking at what works is that it's often been assumed that what works for men will work for women too. And that isn't the case. Some research that I was involved in quite recently in 2009 shows that gender responsiveness in what I've described here as GOBP, it's the gender offending, uh, sorry, it's the general offending behaviour program gender responsiveness, adapting that programme for, men, for, for women uh, can have very positive effects rather than just assuming that the one programme designed for men, based on men, will work uh, for uh, everyone. We have learned that different ways of learning and gender-informed responses can be very positive. Uh, the work of Belenki and others, Women's Ways of Knowing, for example, argues that women's learning differs from men's learning, both in terms of developmental sequence and in terms of underlying theory. And the researchers suggest that most women prefer to learn in collaborative rather than competitive settings. If we put this alongside evidence which suggests that women-only environments facilitate growth and development, we can see that the evidence adds up to a need to work with women in non-authoritarian uh, cooperative settings where women are empowered to engage in social and personal change. In other words, all programmes, all facilities should be made to be gender responsive, should take into account uh, gender. And what we know about women's pathways into crime whether this is strengths-based approaches, relational theory, positive psychology or trauma, should all be taken into account, much more than hitherto. With some clear messages from research and service providers on women's needs then, and from gender-informed theoretical work, we turn to look at what works with women in practice on the ground. Now, whilst it would be hard to describe policy and practice progress in England and Wales as rapid, there's certainly been strong interest in gender-informed practice in working, with women in, uh, in working with women. In the 1980s and 1990s, there were a number of pushes for and prompts for what Pat Carlin has described, women-wise penology. All of this... Astonishingly, really, all of this led to the then Labour government responding positively and saying, yes, let's have a different policy for female offenders. Now, none of, none of the, the, the push, or, uh, push towards gender-informed responses for women, none of this was to persuade the government of the need for a reduction in the use of imprisonment but there was much greater acknowledgement that women's needs were often greater than men's and that women's prison population was growing at a faster rate than men's, with women's needs continuing to be overlooked in a system primarily designed for men. So first of all, the government, the Labour government, designed a special programme for women, the Women's Offending Reduction Programme. And it alerted policymakers to the need for everything to be gender informed, everything to be better tailored and to involve a more appropriate response to the particular factors which have an impact on why women offend. The government even gave £9 million to develop a, a demonstration project for women in the community, a special community services centre in the community for women who were at risk of offending or whose social exclusion put them at risk of, of reoffending. A further prompt to recognise women offenders' distinctive needs came from the deaths of six women in one prison and led the government to commission Baroness Corston to review women with particular vulnerabilities 
in the criminal justice system. Now, it was a commission which Baroness Corston interpreted very liberally, uh, and she resisted any suggestion that the system was acceptable for the majority of women and just needed to be tweaked for a particular, uh, particularly vulnerable minority. Baroness Corston made some very radical, out-of-the-box suggestions. She wanted to close all prisons for women. She wanted to set up residential community centres for them instead. She wanted all policymakers and practitioners to acknowledge women's needs much more than hitherto. The situation is now that there are some 40, over 40, community-based one-stop shops for women in the community, aimed at women at risk of offending, women who've already been involved in offending, and at risk of receiving a, a custodial sentence, and women uh, who've already been in prison too, and who are perhaps at risk of reoffending. Very interesting to look at policy changes like this. We can also learn from lessons on the ground. What we learn from practitioners is that what works best with women is that facilities should be women only, they, women offenders should be dealt with alongside non-offenders. The facilities, the provision, the community centres should foster women's empowerment. Women should be allowed to go back to the centres when they finish their sentence. And the whole milieu, the whole context should be supportive. The centre might even provide a mentor for such women and provide practical help with transport and child care. Child care. So far, so good. The critics of the myths, models and misconceptions have at last got a system which is properly gender informed. At the moment, we have differential treatment for women and men. There is no sentencing policy as such that suggests that men and women should be treated differently. But the differential provision with the community centres for women, but none for men, that really pushes in the direction of differential sentencing. So I now want to turn to my third and concluding uh, comments, which concern gender-specific policies and sentencing in particular. Gender... Gender-specific policies raise the question of reconciling differential treatment with principles of equality. Various pressure groups in England, as well as Baroness Jean Corston, in her government commissioned a major review of all vulnerable women in the criminal justice system, all concluded that applying principles of punishment in an, in an equitable and non-discriminatory way does not entail equal treatment, but rather treatment as an equal. Women should be treated as equals, but that doesn't mean the same treatment. It can mean different treatment. It should be taken account of the fact that women commit less serious offences than men, they're less dangerous, and the social costs of imprisonment are higher than men's, and the differential treatment for men and women within the penal system is justifiable. Equal treatment does not mean identical treatment, whether for women or for members of, a cultural, of cultural or ethnic minorities. But let me conclude with this pause for thought. Essentially, my concern is that we may be losing sight of desert-based principles. Accommodating differences between men and women is clearly important in terms of crime-related needs, and there is emerging evidence to suggest that there may be at least some differences in terms of what works for men and women too. But whether this is sufficient to suggest differential sentencing is highly debatable in my view.
And yet this seems to be the direction in which we're heading. I think this is very controversial. Can a case be made for differential sentencing of women, and particularly for using women's social and economic deprivation as grounds for mitigation in sentence? There's certainly support for the view that women's role as the primary carer is a factor which should be taken into account in sentencing, along with such factors as mental illness, abuse, economic position, and so on, as well as the effect of a custodial sentence on other people in the household. But if women suffer disproportionately greater poverty or abuse, or if they develop drug or alcohol addictions as a result of this abuse, and exclusion, should this really be reflected in the sentencing process? A pre-sentence report and sentence planning could surely take account of these problems and consider how to deal with them, for example, by setting up special programmes to deal with the effects of uh, violence, as as used in some Canadian women's prisons and indeed in the community. Also, If we say that women should not be incarcerated because they're not dangerous, then one could argue that this should also apply to non-dangerous men. Critics might claim that a regime which is accommodating to women, which which give women differential treatment, such as extra home leave from prison to deal with their families, critics have said this would be unfair to men who might also wish to enjoy such advantages. And would be, critics also worry, that this would be met by similar demands from men. But this argument would not defeat a claim for differential treatment, as it could feasibly be extended to men, and it's unlikely to open the floodgates, as relatively few men are primary carers. If we argue that women should not be imprisoned at all because of childcare responsibilities, then we are essentializing women, we're treating all women the same, and we perhaps do an injustice to women who don't have children and to both men who do have children and men who don't. My own modest suggestion is that criminal justice sentencing might acknowledge gender differences in the form of the penalty, that is in the delivery of penalties, but not in the level or amount of punishment. In practical terms, this means sentencing both a man and a woman on the basis of the seriousness of their offence and other sentencing aims, not in terms of their needs or responsibilities. I would add that recognition of differences in the delivery of justice could serve Uh, the legitimacy of the system too. As Paternoster and others have argued, how the criminal justice system process is perceived and experienced is critical to notions of its legitimacy. Recognising differences in the delivery of penalties, in the form of those penalties, important as they are, and I think they are very important indeed, Recognising differences in the delivery of penalties is thus a response to the need for ethicality in this sense. If legitimacy demands that legal authorities treat offenders with respect and dignity, we might argue that recognition of gender, social and cultural differences in the delivery of penalties is essential. This this need not subvert desert-based principles but it will have moral legitimacy. So my conclusion is yes, out of the box, but not too far. Thank you.